Thank you. And I'd like to thank the organizers of this seminar series who invited me here to share my work. Tonight, I'm going to focus on how the United States understood the evolving national security threats emerging from Colombia, how they attempted to address these threats and the legacies of these efforts. Uh, my focus is on an aid package that became known as Plan Colombia. Passed in 2002, the emergency supplemental in support of Plan Colombia was going to help Colombia do it all. Reduce drug trafficking, defeat leftist guerrillas, support peace, and build democracy. Conventional wisdom has it that Colombia was on the verge of collapse, that this project was designed in response to the Colombian crisis and has been a major U.S. foreign policy success. The Plan Colombia success story is the story of what was wrong with Colombia and how we fixed it. In my work, I challenge this conventional wisdom. I argue that the emergence, design, and assessment of Plan Colombia got many critical issues about Colombia wrong. Wrong about what were the critical national security issues in Colombia. Colombia was not on the verge of an insurgency victory by narco guerrillas. Wrong about what Plan Colombia was. It was not a holistic plan that was going to help Colombia overcome um, drug trafficking and wrong about Columbia, what Plan Colombia achieved. It is not an example of successful nation building and Colombia is far from peaceful today. Now Colombia has a very complicated history and I'll be happy to go into more detail um, in the Q&A. But I wanted to start off by explaining that I'm a political anthropologist. And as um, you've been told, I've worked in Colombia for more than two decades, almost three decades now, researching and writing about Plan Colombia since its inception. Um, what I do is ethnographic research. So what I do is watch and listen to people, and I try to understand how people make sense of their own world. My first step is not to judge what they're doing, but to understand why their actions make sense to them, the cultural logics reflected there. And so I talk to people ranging from paramilitary leaders to guerrilla fighters to coca farmers, the people growing the crop that's used for cocaine, um, to congressional staffers. So here's the, one of the congressional buildings in Washington to U.S. military um, attaches at the embassy. And I try to see what are they doing? What are their daily practices? What are they saying? How do they explain their values and norms? And I do other kinds of research. I do archival research with declassified government doc, um, documents as well. But my questions about national security may start from a different place than many of the speakers that you've heard in this series. So I ask, how is national security defined? Security for whom? How are the threats to national security imagined and produced? Arguing that these threats do not exist out there in the world, but that we have to make them. We have to teach people how to understand what the threats are that we're facing. They come into being through cultural and material work. So I'm gonna begin with the story of what was wrong with Colombia in the 1990s. So this was a story of Colombia on the verge of collapse. In interviews, senior um, Defense Department officials described their view of Colombia at the time as a country that was sliding off the table. We were in danger of losing Colombia, they told me. Um, studies from the National Defense University Institute for National Strategic Studies concluded that Colombia risked either becoming a narco state or disintegrating. Influential political scientists at Harvard ranked Colombia as at risk of a, becoming a failing state next to Iraq. North Korea and Indonesia. Now, it is true that Colombia had a lot of issues at the time, an economic crisis with the country's first period of negative growth in a century, ongoing issues with violence and drug trafficking, the world's biggest producers of coca for the cocaine trade, and the longest running guerrilla war in the hemisphere. And this is what people in the United States and many of the Colombian elite at the time fixed on as the biggest indicator of the Colombian crisis. The primary threat to the Colombian state was that the narco guerrillas were going to take over. These were the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia, the FARC, Colombia's oldest and largest guerrilla group, who are back in the news now because of their um, ongoing peace talks with the Colombian government going on in Havana, very close to being realized, forecast for conclusion in late March, but they haven't managed to find the, sign the final agreements, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. 
But at the time, defense intelligence agencies and others were telling Colombian officials that the Colombian army was losing the war and that it would be defeated in five years, that the FARC was better equipped than the Colombian military. The FARC was discussed in Washington not as benefiting from drug trafficking, but as the central player in the Colombian drug trade. Um, and so one of the person, people saying this was General Barry McCaffrey, who I understand you'll have the opportunity to hear this Saturday, so you can come and maybe ask him some questions about this. Um, he was the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy and later, and early, prior to that, the head of Southcom. And he testified many times before Congress, emphasizing the growing role of the FARC in the drug trade. But what is a narco guerrilla? This term was actually invented by a US ambassador, Louis Tams, who was ambassador to Columbia in the 1980s, who invented this term to describe the ways in which the view that insurgencies throughout the region were using drug trafficking to finance their operations. This term was used a lot in the end of the Cold War, discursively linking communist groups with criminal drug trafficking elements. And this term does a lot of cultural work. It delegitimizes movements' claims, political claims, by categorizing them as criminal organizations and justifies escalating military aid to their opponents, usually state um, security forces, by alleging that they have to fight against the nearly limitless resources of the drug trade. And they combine two things that US officials love to hate, communists and drug traffickers. So of course, they would be go great together. The, this term solved a political problem for policymakers, how to get military aid into the field at a time when politicians were skittish about counterinsurgency aid. And by classifying this as counter-narcotics aid, they avoided this reluctance to get involved in these types of operations. But there are several problems with this. First, it doesn't accurately represent what the Colombian guerrillas are and denying them the political logic of their guerrilla insurgencies. It overestimates their, political, their military power, exaggerating the threat they pose to the Colombian state. Secondly, it doesn't accurately reflect reflect the drug trade itself, how it was evolving and who the major players were. And finally, as a result, it missed a major threat to Colombian national security. And these were drug trafficking paramilitary forces that were in many regions allied with the Colombian military. So who were the FARC? Are the FARC? <laughs> They claim to be a political and military organization oriented toward the overthrow of the state in defense of the rural poor. They have a very deep history in land conflicts and communist leftist organizing, coming from the enclaves of peasants who organized to escape persecution by landowners in the 1960s, becoming so-called independent republics, operating outside the control of the central state. 1964, they um, adopted a Marxist platform and announced themselves as an official guerrilla movement. But for much of their early years remained only a loose federation of very marginal scattered groups. In 1982, this changed. In their seventh conference, the FARC decided to focus on expansion with a new military, political, and financial strategies. The new military strategy was to shift their tactics from traditional guerrilla warfare of ambush and retreat to more conventional military tactics, attack, um, holding territory, particularly around major cities. This transformation was signaled by adding a new part to their name, the FARC-EP, Ejército del Pueblo, the Army of the People. Inspired by Sandinista's triumph in Nicaragua in 1979, emboldened by the growth of social movements and labor strikes in Colombia, the group declared ambitious plans to take power in eight years. They had a new political strategy, with new networks of urban cadres that were part of a political movement that was born of a frustrated peace talks with the government in the 1980s, the Patriotic Union. The FARC increased recruitment of workers, intellectuals, students, and lawyers, so trying to expand from their traditional, very peasant, very rural base. They used this power to gain social control, mediate disputes, and exercise government, governance in the areas where they controlled. So this is a poster that I saw on one of my first trips to the Southern Columbia in 1999. It was hung on a major road. And as you can see along the bottom, it's listed as from the 32nd front of the Southern block of the FARC. 
The title, for those of you who don't read Spanish, is Fines and Sanctions for Living in a Dignified and Honest Community. And it lists all of the things that local rules and regulations that local community members had to abide by with the corresponding fines in the case of their violations. This include everything from not being at gossip to failing to protect communal and public space, selling land without permission from local commanders, bringing in unknown people or prostitutes, and a 6 p.m. curfew. So they were very invested in controlling daily life um, in this region. Now the new financial strategy was um, required because they needed money to finance these operations. And they got this money from the, inc the taxation of the illegal narcotics trade to finance their growth. Now these resources were available to them in part as an unintended consequence of U.S. drug policy. So as the U.S. was successful in interdicting coca paste that was grown in Bolivia and Peru, flown to Colombia for um, refining and then shipped to the United States in the area inter air interdiction program, this resulted in this crop moving into Colombia. And by the 1990s, the southern Colombia, particularly the state of Putumayo and Cacatá, um, were the biggest source of coca for the world's cocaine trade in the world. And this region, not coincidentally, was also the FARC's stronghold. Now, their econo the FARC's economic relationship to the coca trade changed over time. So this is a coca plant. They give three harvests a year. Um, and the FARC expanded its taxation system, starting with the middlemen and traffickers and then beginning to tax the peasant farmers themselves, gramaje which is the price per gram of coca paste. Um, so these are photos from my field work. Coca paste was produced by the peasant farmers themselves in Colombia. I compare it to a uh, kind of strategy of making jam. You're taking a product, agricultural product that is bulky, hard to transport, doing a minimal refining process and producing something that has a long shelf life, a guaranteed market, and an easy transport. So the FARC at this time was clearly engaged in criminal practices. I don't want to sugarcoat, <laughs> by emphasizing their political claims, I don't want to sugarcoat their um, really draconian um, practices in enforcing these norms and standards in the communities, as well as their increasing use of kidnapping as an alternative funding strategy. And this um, was a very incredibly uh, widespread practice that had many, many con devastating consequences for Colombian families. But at the same time, I want to emphasize that the FARC did not start up as drug traffickers. They moved up the drug production chain, starting with the lowest rung, peasant farmers producing coca for the cocaine trade, trading within the region, and then moving to the um, more refining and trafficking operations as time went on. Now, what did the FARC do with this money? They didn't um, engage in the extravagant practices you associate with the Medellin traffickers. They didn't have gold faucets on their bathrooms. They didn't have lavish estates. They doubled their troop numbers to approximately 20,000. They bought new weapons. They bought new um, communication systems. But they were still operating in a country of 42 million people, a country larger than France. And they remained marginal um, in these southern areas in particular. Um, and in fact, they, their broader levels of political support declined significantly during this period. So despite the FARC's real gains in military and operational ca uh, capabilities, media accounts as well as some Colombian and U.S. policymakers consistently exaggerated the growing strength of the FARC and its ability to pose a serious threat to the Colombian state. So the guerrillas were repeatedly described during this period as controlling 40% of the country, um, which sounds like a lot, and in fact was often rounded up to, oh, it must be about half. But few clarified that this control was of these southern jungle lowlands. Um, so this part of the country right here, which is in fact half the territory, but houses less than 10% of the people of Colombia, none of its industry. Remarkably little infrastructure. In fact, people, when they look at the maps in my office, often, often ask me, why did they leave the roads off the other half of Columbia? Because there are no roads. These are flooded plains that have very minimal state presence. 
Planned Columbia supporter Tom Mark suggested that the frequent discussion of the FARC's control of half the country was a distortion of a 1997 Colombian Army report which stated that 13% of the country's mayors had direct links to the guerrillas, but that 44% had contact with them. A background memo prepared for Undersecretary Pickering in 1988 presented a more accurate assessment reporting that the ELN and the FARC combined controlled about 13% of the Columbia's 1,070 municipalities, where they act as the de facto government, where and they have presence in two-thirds of the country. So during this period, part of their changed military strategy was also to attack military garrisons and take over towns. And during these spectacular attacks, in which hundreds of soldiers and police were killed or taken prisoner, and some of them were remained as FARC hostages for up to 12 years, so this was a very dramatic um, and violent attack. These attacks were also cited as proof of the FARC's increasing military strength. They were symbolically important, um, and they showed the intention of the FARC to expand their military capability. But again, these uh, accounts did not emphasize that these were very remote towns in this part of the country where very few people live, far from urban and political power centers. These dramatic incidents did not result in administrative control of significant territory, nor did they demonstrate any military ability to take over any of the country's major cities. So daily life in cities during this period was largely unaffected, with the exception of the limitation on travel because of the fear of kidnapping, which was a uh, very significant concern. So we can see that FARC was clearly a significant security issue, but not an existential one, not threatening the existence of the nation state. So now I want to move on to my second critique, which is that this idea of the narco guerrillas does not allow us to understand what was actually happening with the drug trade during this period. Um, so you may recognize Pablo Escobar, his exploits being shown on night, ne um, Netflix on the show Narcos. And you probably know the story of how the initial cocaine boom was dominated by two sprawling networks based in the Colombian cities of Medellin and Cali, labeled cartels, although they didn't actually function as um, controlling monopoly prices, but were in fact kind of loose networks of trafficking organizations. And the complex and evolving relationship between the illegal cocaine trade and Colombian political life is too vast to explore here, obviously, but I wanna highlight what was happening during this period was the intersection of the historic use of extrajudicial violence, death squads, vigilante groups, to enforce political interests, consolidate political power, commonly referred to paramilitary groups, and how they intersected with the rising power of the drug trade. In the 1980s, money from the drug trade allowed paramilitary forces to evolve from small groups linked to local uh, regional economies and local military commanders to vast private armies. In part, this was because tra the traffickers bought massive tracts of land in a process known as the reverse agrarian reform, becoming major landowners in order to launder money and buy their way into the traditional re regional elites. And as the owners of these vast haciendas, drug traffickers were natural allies of the Colombian military in their counterinsurgency campaigns. Traffickers needed protection from guerrillas who would attack them, extorting them, demanding protection money, and increasingly kidnapping them as part of the rural, um, rural elite. So drug traffickers, business leaders, and local military commanders began to work together in regional groups that were generically known as paramilitary forces, targeting guerrillas, their presumed sympathizers, as well as political reformers and government investigators who looked into this industry. Now this fusion of counterinsurgency ideology and illegal narcotics revenue produced one of the most lethal fighting forces in Latin America. They were in their initial period in the late 1980s divided regionally throughout the country. Henry Perez and Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha in the middle Magdalena Valley, the Eastern Plain region split between Rodriguez Gacha and Emerald Baron Victor Carranza, Fidel Castaño on the northern coast, and Pablo Escobar with his Medellin-based Army of Young Assassins for Hire, known as Sicarios. Now, as the heads of the Medellin cartel and Cali cartels were killed and ja or jailed in the early 1990s, a new generation of traffickers and warlords emerged from this cartel hierarchy. 
They were paramilitary traffickers who had come up and been trained in these techniques of violence and economic trade, if you will. And their highest profile organization was the Northern Valle Cartel. Their vertically integrated illegal operations employed new and constantly changing shipping routes for moving cocaine through Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. These groups are also frequently referred to as cartelitos, or the baby cartel structure. Now, at the same time, a national network of newly legalized paramilitary, I'm sorry, peasant defense cooperatives also contributed to the growth of these paramilitary organizations. Now, paramilitaries or irregular, um, indigenous irregulars have a long history in counterinsurgency doctrine and strategy. They were legal for much of Colombia's early history in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, but were briefly outlawed in 1989. In the early 1990s, they once again came to the fore of the Colombian military's counterinsurgency strategy through a new legal structure known as the Convivir, which literally means coexistence, but actually glosses a much wider sense of living together and tolerance. Um, so officially launched in 1994, many of these groups served as fronts for paramilitary organizations. And only one example um, were documents from the very widely publicized lawsuit from Chiquita Banana. So they were um, paid paramilitary groups because of their operations in the banana zone, producing zone in northern Colombia. They paid money to paramilitary groups in order to buy off their protection between 1997 and 2003. And some of these payments passed through a Santa Marta based, it's a, a, coast, a coastal town in northern Colombia, a convivir based there directly to the paramilitaries in that region. And interestingly, the co company's official defense, Chiquita Bananas, part of their defense in this lawsuit was everybody was doing it. What were we supposed to do? That's kind of what people did. So in 1997, the paramilitary leadership, all deeply involved in drug trafficking organizations, announced a new national coordinating body, the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, the AUC, and offensive military operations into new regions. These campaigns were funded by contributions, extortion, from businessmen and regional elites. In many cases, they were voluntary contributions, but in some cases, extortion, and from the profits of the drug trade. Now, they used these newly uh, created mobile squads, elite training and combat units to carry out these operations, which followed a typical pattern, coming into a new area, committing a, a large scale public massacre of 10 or 20 people in the town square, targeting the civilian population, so the key religious and community leaders in the region, and then setting up an actual paramilitary base in the town. According to Colombian government statistics, the AUC committed more than 900 massacres between 1997 and 2002. All of this was done with the close coordination of regional and local military commanders. In typical Colombian black humor, the paramilitaries became known as the armed branch of the army, el brazo armado del ejército. While the soldiers were at home in barracks or occupying the small towns after they had been pacified, the paramilitaries were fighting the counterinsurgency war, primarily by targeting civilians. Throughout the country, survivors described military forces scouting the region prior to paramilitary attacks, blocking escape routes. Military officers would themselves tell villagers that paramilitary forces were on their way, referencing the spectacular brutal violence that they would carry out such as public acts of torture committed with acid machetes and chainsaws. In some cases, paramilitary and military forces carried out joint patrols. Commanders were often seen drinking and socializing together. So now I want to return to Plan Columbia. So this is the scene in Columbia as Plan Columbia is being designed. According to its supporters, Plan Columbia was a holistic plan designed by Colombians, through, produced through consensus to bring Colombia back from the brink and cut illegal drug production by 50%. But in fact, it was a military aid package. About 80% of the initial package was military aid. It was also not a consensus. And there was very interesting debates going on at the time where the Republican members of Congress were actually backing the Colombian National Police who were bitterly divided against the Colombian military, who were backed by the Democrats during the Clinton administration, who were using their escalate, this escalating counter-narcotics military aid as a way of fending off panic over sexual impropriety, you may 
remember the Monica Lewinsky scandal, as well as critiques that they were soft on drugs. Proposals from USAID and other less powerful civilian agencies who were advocating civilian aid and a focus on development, a focus on judicial reform, often found their proposals stripped of money and funding in order to contribute new helicopters to the aid package. So I want to pause for a minute and think about how it is that military aid came to be a central focus of this counter-narcotics program. So I've already talked about the narco-guerrilla thesis, which collapsed counter-narcotics and counterinsurgency goals. And by reconfiguring the complex and multi-actor illegal drug trade into a simple linear process dominated by Marxist guerrillas, produced reduced um, counter-narcotics policy to eliminating the insurgency. But this, this package was also made possible by the increasing militarization of drug policy throughout the 1990s. And this was the time when the war on drugs in the United States went from being a metaphor to a real war involving combat helicopters, military advisors, and dedicated army battalions. So I'm interested in excavating how this switch happened, how this policy became dominated by military concerns in, in the foreign source country uh, counter-narcotics operations. And I argue that it was the zero tolerance paradigm that the United States embraced domestically in the 1980s that provided the ideological architecture for the subsequent militarization of domestic drug policy abroad. And so here I'm arguing we need to look at the genealogy of contemporary national security threats, not within Colombia, but within the United States. So as I'm sure you all remember, Richard Nixon declared the first war on drugs in 1971. Um, and he linked fighting drug consumption to his law and order agenda, his fear about the growing strength of the counterculture. But, so even while he was um, keeping domestic counter-narcotics operations under the control of medical professionals and focused on treatment, he was sowing the seeds for this later militarization of the policy. After the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, white middle-class parents mobilized as the National Federation of Parents for Drug-Free Youth. Working with the First Lady, um, some of you may also remember these programs, um, to redefine drug policy around the adage, just say no. Reacting to the widely perceived decline in parental authority and the so-called traditional values, this was the first wave of what became the culture wars of the 1980s and saw middle class white youth as profoundly vulnerable to illegal drug use. In the view of these parents group, any exposure to drugs inevitably led to extreme addiction. These parents and policymakers felt that the notion of recovery meant that addicts could get well, a message that they felt undermined their warnings not to use drugs. And I see this logic today in my home state of Maine, where we have a governor who has consistently denied funding for treatment and access to overdose medication, even while we are in the midst of a heroin and opiate um, epidemic but he continues to insist that to use these new medical treatments that can allow for recovery from overdose would somehow give carte blanche to youth to use these drugs. So cocaine addiction and the crack economy during this period did have real and devastating effects in many communities, particularly among inner city African Americans, but I want to emphasize the ways in which um, racist stereotypes and inaccurate understandings of the nature of addiction um, really fueled these failed policies. And so for just one example of how race paid out in domestic policies, the 1986 anti-drug abuse law mandated grossly unequal sentencing structures. So the mandatory, mandatory minimum sentence was five years for five grams of crack versus 500 grams of powder cocaine. Crack, of course, was associated with African-American inner city use and powder cocaine with white users. And you can see this playing out in the current debates over mass incarceration and racialized law enforcement in the drug war today. Now, trying to remove any possibility of access to drugs required cutting them off at the source. And so in 1986, President Ronald Reagan issued National Security Directive um, 221, formally declaring drugs a national security threat. 
The 1989 Omnibus Anti-Crime Bill dramatically expanded domestic drug enforcement bureaucracy, creating the Office of National Drug Control Policy and making the Defense Department the lead federal agency for interdiction efforts in support of law enforcement. Now, at the time, there was military resistance to this new mission, which I think is important to emphasize. These are historical processes that um, were very controversial at the time. Military officers testified before Congress that focusing on reducing demand would be a more appropriate strategy. Um, and that one senior Defense Department official told me that the counter-narcotics mission was completely driven by Congress. There was argument about different mandates and mission. The military mission is focused on applying overwhelming force for a total victory. Law enforcement obviously has a mission of community protection, criminal investigation, evidence gathering. This is a quote from one senior Southcom military officer who was involved in counter narcotics operations who made the comparison with mowing the lawn. The mission is always there, talking about law enforcement. Every week, you have to go out and mow the lawn. That's what the Coast Guard does. You're always going to have to do coastline patrol, patrol fisheries, do drug missions. You're mowing the lawn every week. The military abhors mowing the lawn. The military wants to pave it over, to finish, to never have to mow the lawn again. So I would just want to touch on this as pointing out the kind of really deep institutional resistance um, during this period. However, over the next decade, the U.S. military, in particular Southcom, did an about-face and enthusiastically embraced the counter-narcotics operations. One is that they were given this mission. So obviously, not being a politically deciding force, they had to take the missions that were given to them. But at the same time, they began to enthusiastically lobby on behalf of more counter-narcotics operations. Framed as a national security threat, the counter-narcotics mission represented an ideological justification for the military, just as its primary adversary and principal imagined threat disintegrated the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. Drugs represented the communism of the 1990s, wrote retired Colonel Richard Downey in his assessment. The drug war was a means of staving off lowered military budgets. So during, I was thinking, this was the period of be, the golden age between the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the War on Terror when we thought history was over and we had won and everything was kind of settled. And there were going to be lowered military budgets, um, defense budget cuts, military downsizing. So this, these new missions were a bureaucratic imperative. And these two conceptualizations of national security threats, narco guerrillas in Colombia, and the um, militarization of the drug war in the United States resulted in a plant Columbia that was dominated by military aid and made the Colombian military the major U.S. partner. Now I'm going to turn to the legacies of Plan Columbia. So U.S. policymakers and pundits have been declaring Plan Columbia a success story since the mid-2000s claiming it created a Colombian miracle, brought the country back from the brink. In his 2013 confirmation hearing, Secretary of State John Kerry said Colombia is a model for the region. It's an example to the rest of Latin America about what awaits them if we can convince people to make better decisions. Last January, uh, Vice President Joe Biden suggested that it might be a model for um, Central America. And there's been lots of comparisons between the aid package for Mexico, Plan Merida, and Plan Colombia. Colombian police officers are instructing Afghan Investigators, Colombian soldiers train foreign military forces around the world. The Colombian government's tourist slogan is, the only risk is you'll want to stay. <laughs> I love that. But what was the nature of this success? Plan Colombia's stated counterinsurgency's objectives was the reduction of coca production by 50%. By this metric, complete failure. Colombia remains the world leader in coca production, which has moved into the new areas of the country, even as cocaine remains readily available in the United States. New trafficking routes have spread narco violence into new areas, including throughout Central America and, of course, Mexico. So we can see the violence in these countries again as a byproduct of U.S. counter narcotics policy. The counter narcotics objectives of Plan Colombia are forgotten or dismissed with a wink and a wave by those who today proclaim its success. While drug trafficking remains a problem, the Rand Corporation wrote in 2009, Colombia is no longer in danger of becoming either a failed state or an anemic, low-growth, quasi-democracy. The, they claim that the real success is in the decline of violence, the counterinsurgency victories, 
and the nation building efforts. Now these claims rest on the real, and this is true, dramatic decline in violence in Colombia. The situation on the ground in most communities has changed markedly since my first trips through southern Colombia in the late 1990s. But these claims, also, these claims also rest on the government's apparent counterinsurgency triumph. The FARC has not surrendered, but they have been largely defeated. Massive investment in military infrastructure did have results. Um, so from 2000 to 2007, the number of standing troops in the Colombian military increased 45%. Numerous elite special units have been created. The military budget grew dramatically from 3.4% of the GDP in 2000 to 5.2% in 2007. Now this was not the product of US aid, but it was the product of US advice and it was spurred on by US aid. And the US did supply helicopters to improve troop mobility, US intelligent equipment, US advisors, helped coordinate the major campaign Plan Patriota, targeting guerrilla forces in the South. US officials channeled untold millions through classified black budgets for intelligence and weapons including laser-guided um, smart bombs. The FARC has been forced into strategic retreat, hit hard by combat losses and the um, assassination or the killings of major leaders. So these were um, a series of senior commanders who were targeted in bombing um, attacks in 2011, 2010. So the number of FARC troops has declined from an estimated high of 20,000 to 8,000 in 2010. And in the areas where I do research, FARC roadblocks no longer restrict travel. There's no curfew. The women community leaders can walk the streets at night, can visit freely um, in the towns. And this is a real and important gain. But the war was also won through the government's countenance of brutal um, these brutal drug trafficking paramilitary groups. Through their counterinsurgency operations, the paramilitary armies of the late 1990s acted as a form of proxy violence for the state. This violence pushed guerrillas into more remote regions, breaking their supply chains and facilitating military occupation of small towns, while allowing the state security forces to meet the human rights requirements of U.S. assistance and perform the professionalism required of their institutional patrons in the U.S. government. So at the time Plan Columbia began, U.S. policymakers and analysts were very critical of the Colombian military. The CIA called it a garrison force that was corrupt, abusive, and involved with drug trafficking. One senior congressional staffer told me that he regarded the Colombian military as a criminal organization, unprofessional, unaccountable, and inefficient. In 1997, the U.S. Congress passed the Leahy Law, well, the Leahy Amendment, which became the Leahy Law, prohibiting U.S. counterinsurgency assistance counter-narcotics assistance, excuse me, from going to foreign military units that were facing credible allegations of abuse. When they tried to find any that met this criteria, they could not find any Colombian military units that met this criteria. Instead of pausing and pushing for systemic reform, the U.S. came up with a new military aid strategy, creating new units that were made up of vetted individuals, so people that they could not attach these accusations to. Now, Colombian paramilitaries are the result of the privatization of state security functions, a spectrum of practices that include the use of mercenaries, private guards, and other military entrepreneurs. Part of this work involves spectacular violence, public torture, dismemberment, mass killing, and rape. These forces took up the work of the state in many arenas. They exerted governance in many of the areas that they controlled. So in many of the towns that they took over, they would um, enforce clothing codes. If you were a woman, you had to wear a skirt. You had to have, if you were a man, you had to have short hair. You couldn't go out at night. You had to put up certain kinds of Christmas decorations outside your house. At the same time, they were acting in concert with the state in close and deliberate alliance with military and police forces to carry out counterinsurgency campaigns. The full extent of this violence will never be known. At the same time, there are ongoing scandals within the Colombian military that point to the troubling legacy of the lack of systemic reform, most notably the body count scandal, um, the falsos positivos, in which more than 3,000 young men have been taken off the streets in poor, marginal um, urban communities, killed and dressed up as guerrillas killed in combat. And it's called the body count scandal because this was done in order to receive the promotion and benefits of meeting a certain body count standard. 
So I want to conclude with some troubling reflections on the ongoing threat paramilitaries pose to Colombian democracy and political life, a different kind of national security threat. So when drug trafficker and paramilitary warlord Salvatore Mancuso boasted in 2005 that he controlled 30% of the Colombian Congress, most analysts view his claim as wishful thinking. But by 2011, more than 120 former and current members of Congress, approximately one third, had come under investigation for paramilitary ties, and more than 40 have been convicted. Testimony by demobilized paramilitaries have implicated hundreds of members of the armed forces, thousands of private citizens, and politicians throughout the country. Although much of their leadership has been jailed, extradited, or killed in infighting, Regional power structures linking legal and illegal commerce, official military forces with mil mercenary assassins, assassins, and the rapacious desire to defeat reformists are still intact in many parts of Colombia. The 2011 Victims and Land Restitution Law set out procedures for reparations for people forced to flee from their land. The law's real innovation was an effort to return land to those forced out of rural areas, a significant issue in a country with millions of internally displaced people, and one that could result in real systemic change in the country's wealth and power base. This process faces, as you can imagine, formidable challenges, but among them is that the redistribution efforts have been prevented by threats and assassinations by people attempting to reclaim their land. Much of this violence is carried out by the remnants and reorganized paramilitary groups, known as neo-paramilitary forces or BACRIM, a Spanish acronym for bandas criminales, criminal bands, that have returned to functioning death squad style rather than as occupying armies. They no longer settle into small towns, set up bases, carry out massive public displays. Instead, they target, assassinate, and intimidate key leaders of social movements. And social media has been a really interesting, for an anthropologist, new place where these kinds of threats take place. So death squad lists circulating on Facebook, people posting things on Twitter. Um, so you have the old school kind of photocopied pamphlet death threat, but now it's moving in these new ways. Um, so they're targeting, assassinating, intimidating key leaders of social movements promoting reform, and a record high number of human rights defenders are reporting attacks and threats. Now, these things do not only stymie reform efforts and leftist organizing, they also threaten the fundamental exercise of democracy and could have an incredibly chilling and possible preventing effect on the ultimate FARC peace agreement and demobilization. So I'm going to end with just two sets of lessons. One is the implications for Colombia. I think the real shifts in the, Columbia, in the country over the past decade I recognize them, but they should not obscure the ongoing issues with paramilitary violence and the threat that these, this violence poses to democracy and ongoing state building efforts. And some lessons for us here in the United States. Foreign policy lessons that we need to think more critically about how we define and what constitutes national security threats. That impunity, not dealing with institutional and systemic criminality and violence, shapes ongoing political life and is itself a significant threat to democracy and state building. And we need to think a little bit more carefully about who our allies are. And then as an anthropologist, I would say that we need to take seriously local understanding and local meanings and how people, whether they're drug addicts trying to find treatment or cocoa farmers producing cocoa paste because they have no other alternative in the transnational um, agricultural markets, how they're trying to make sense of their experience and what their options are. Finally, I think we should deeply reconsider the militarization of counter-narcotics policy. And this, because I like to end on a hopeful note, I think is one of the areas where there has been some really interesting changes. We're in the middle of a new moment for thinking about drug policy, not as a national security issue, but as a public health one. And there's lots of space now in public debate in the United States that there wasn't 10 or 15 years ago for thinking about alternative approaches. Thank you. Who would you say are the major beneficiaries of paramilitary violence? So there are, I think globally, if we look at the economic changes that have happened in Colombia, so one of the things that's really clear is the way that 
um, this violence cleared off land. And it cleared off land for um, new investment in agribusiness, um, so big monocrops of African palm, less so of soy. But those people benefited. Whether or not they were directly involved in promoting this violence, they have clearly benefited from it. And one of the loopholes in the land restitution law is that if you have gone in, Article 90 says, if you've gone in and made these kind of investments in land that was abandoned for whatever reason, um, you can stake a claim on it. So that's another significant um, obstacle for people returning to their land. And the other big issue in Colombia, as it is throughout Latin America, is the extractive industries. So when I go to southern Colombia now, um, you see Canadian oil exploration going on all over the place, um, primarily Canadian, but transnational oil exploration. One of the problems that Colombia is facing, along with a lot of other countries in Latin America, is what's happening with the fall in oil prices. So the Colombian economy, oil is Colombia's biggest legal export and it's a basis of their economy, and it's gonna mean there's been a number of austerity measures coming in, and I don't know if this kind of push for oil exploration is gonna withstand the fall in oil prices. But those kinds of interests have clearly been the beneficiaries. Um, in terms of, I mean, one of the interesting things that people other than anthropologists like to track are the kind of the changing couple figures, like who's in charge of these different fronts. Um, I find that less interesting. I'm more interested in how these processes change the daily life for people who are living in these regions. But a lot of what we see is a recycling of the capos, but not changing these power structures themselves. After a lot of the violence in Argentina and other Latin American countries, you had, uh, after a while, uh, truth commissions, if you would, trying to sort out what happened. Uh, is Colombia close to that? And if so, uh, where is that going right now? That's a great question. So one of the many incredibly complicated things that I did not have time to even mention was that Colombia demobilized these paramilitary armies between 2003 and 2007, about 32,000 paramilitary troops officially demobilized. They got transitional justice rights, so there were special sentencing for them that were, they gave them uh, eight year sentences. If you confessed to your crimes, um, then you would get the special eight year sentence. It didn't matter how many hundreds, in some cases, of people that you had been responsible for killing. And so one of the things that's happening now in Colombia is that those people are getting out of jail because they have served their eight-year sentences. So this is another factor contributing to the concerns about emergent violence. Another thing that happened out of that process was the creation of state-sponsored memory projects. So Colombia has actually been in what anthropologists call a memory boom of a lot of activity around producing different stories about the violence. So there was a state-sponsored historical memory group that was made up of academics. They produced about 20 book-length studies of emblematic cases. You can find them all on the internet in Spanish if you're interested. Um, and they remain, they've finished their mandate, uh, but they remain active um, now, I think, in a more kind of NGO capacity, or non-governmental organization. Now, the true, the talks with the FARC are also going to produce their own kind of truth commission. So they have had part of the series of pre-agreements that have been signed up until the, um, in anticipation of a final agreement and ultimate demobilization, is to set up a peace, um, sorry, a truth commission-like body. It would have a three-year mandate. It would have international representation. It would not produce, it would not hand over evidence to legal trials. So it's consistent with other experiences in Latin America. This would not be linked to judicial investigations, but it would be something about reckoning the violence. One of the things about Colombia is the violence has been tremendously complicated. So unlike cases of the Civil War in El Salvador, um, or the military dictatorships in the Southern Cone, you had pretty well-defined sides. In Colombia, this mix of criminal violence, drug trafficking, um, different guerrilla groups, I mean, I emphasize the FARC, but we still have another active guerrilla group in Colombia, the ELN, along with many others, 
people can't even agree on when such a commission would start. So the Historical Memory Commission um, started with events happening after 1985. But a lot of people complained. Why would, why would you pick that date? Why not earlier? Who is that leaving out? Um, another thing that's really different about the Colombian conflict is because of the tremendously high number of kidnapped, uh, people who've experienced kidnapping, they estimate about 40,000 people in Colombia were kidnapped, um, the majority by the guerrilla forces. It's a very different kind of, um, people are taking on the mantle of being victims and speaking for victims of the conflict in a very different kind of way. So in countries like Guatemala or El Salvador or during the Southern Cone, you had a very pretty specific political profile of who's a victim. In Colombia, you have everyone is a victim and everyone is attempting to use that political power and political legitimacy in order to kind of advance different kinds of agendas. Um, a number of uh, the Colombian military says they're victims of the conflict. Um, you know, very elite politicians are victims um, and then peasants are victims. So it's a very much more complex political terrain for this kind of group to operate. Thank you for your talk today. I wrote down a couple of uh, points that you mentioned there was um, that brought about the uh, Plan Columbia into action from the United States, the transition of the FARC to uh, a conventional force from guerrilla tactics, the expansion from just peasants to intellectuals, bringing in community members from the urban areas, showing that there was some influence going into the urban areas the setup of shadow government, the rule of law that they were setting up, um, doubling their numbers to, to 20,000, and um, spectacular attacks against military strong points. Um, and now it's back down to 8,000. It seems to me that that is a, su a success. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't think I completely agree with your analogy of of how that has been um, detrimental. It was a counterinsurgency, not necessarily just a counter-narcotics. Counter-narcotics was, of course, the funding mechanism. As somebody who's been in Columbia and spent considerable time as a practitioner mm -hmm. on the ground and observed a lot of this firsthand. As we were implementing Plan Columbia in 2000, a great, in my mind anyway, is a comparison with what was happening with Venezuela. So we've seen an, an upward trend with Colombia since we implemented Plan Colombia, and a downward trend as their neighbor in Venezuela. And I know there's some other factors in there, but democracy is spiraling to a failed state, it seems like, in Venezuela and continues to do so. Colombia now is an exporter of security and works with the U.S. military in Central America and South America to help with some of the security threats no longer consumes resources from the United States to stabilize their own country. How would you compare Venezuela, where we did not offer help and there wasn't a plan Venezuela, would you compare that to Plan Colombia and how they have turned out today? Thank you. Okay. Um, so I tried to be clear that I do think there were significant, there has been a significant reduction in violence. I do agree that the FARC um, has been largely defeated. I guess my point is more that that, in my view, is the fruit of a poison tree. That the role of the paramilitaries and the, the degree to which they continue to permeate political life has really, um, to such a profound degree, um, hampered the ability of Colombia to develop a democracy and a security for all of its citizens. And I'm guessing we're gonna have to agree to disagree on that point. Um, in terms of the comparison with Venezuela, I mean, it's interesting, but to me, I mean, there are apples and oranges. Venezuela did not have a counterinsurgency war. They have, they're a drug transshipment country, but don't have a, the anywhere near the depth of the kind of cartel structure or drug production there. I mean, I would put what's happening in Venezuela more along the lines of the ways we see things breaking down in Brazil, um, somewhat less, but hints of this perhaps in Bolivia, where you have 
leftist populist movements that come to power and really exacerbate this incredible chasm between elites and the um, kind of majority poor that these populist governments are trying to empower through various income redistribution plans. And I think the example of Venezuela is the least democratic of them, obviously, in the way that Chavez really stripped down the institutions of government and the crisis following his death has only kind of gone much higher. What you're seeing there is ex, um, kind of a dramatic expansion in urban violence and crime, certainly, and destabilizing the government. But I think the comparisons with Colombia, in my view, are, are pretty limited in terms of um, what the US role could be or even how the, the emergence of this violence. Good afternoon. I'm Coronel Correa, Colombian Army. Um, more than a question, I would like to give you some inputs uh, to you, of course, and for everybody of the audience about some issues that you talk here. I want to give more input about it or, or another ideas. Uh, first of all, and reinforcing what, what you comment right now, Colombia in 2002, there were about 26,000 uh, violent killings. And in 2012, it went down to 43% to 15,000. I know it's a big number, but it went down 33%. The kidnapping in 2002 was, in, and it was not a specifically target kidnapping. It was indiscriminately target, uh, kidnap targeting. They call it the, the miracle fishing. It's called Pesca Milagrosa. They just made a roadblock out of the big cities and stopped 50 cars, take everybody down, take it to the mountains, and they start doing checks about what was the budget of that family, of that person. If uh, it was uh, very poor, maybe maybe they will leave it, let it go for as low as maybe $10,000, $20,000. If it was a political or person with money, they will write the money and keep them for many months, not just looking for political, military, or police target, just indiscriminate. Uh, and it went down 93% in 2012. So it went down from 3,500 3, kidnapping to only 177. It's still a big number, but, but of course it went down. The GDP increased, as you said very well, uh, uh, 65% from that period, 2002, 2012. And the tourism uh, went up 98%. What is tourism? And that's what, that's what the propaganda you were talking about, the only reason was, is to stay. Um, it's because at that time, in, in the late 90s, especially the US and maybe and many other countries, in their recommendations for the travelers overseas used to say, hey, don't go to Colombia, Colombia is a risky place, don't go to Colombia. And it was forbidden for the US city, or not forbidden, there was um, almost forbidden to U.S. citizens to go to Colombia because it was dangerous. They don't go to Colombia. So that gives the, the propaganda or the commercial in the, in the news and in the tourist offices. The only risk to go to Colombia is wanted to stay because the tourism increased in 98%. Before that, in, in 2000 or on the late 90s, people could not go from Bogota, the capital city, one hour away without the risk of being kidnapped. And I'm talking about Bogota, the main capital. If we talk about other cities, a little bit more remote from Bogota, like Cali, Medellin, and rural cities, even more dangerous because of the medical fishing, Pesca Milagrosa. So when they established security, it increased. Um, talking about, and I'm not going to talk just about the point you made here about the, let me see, I'm sorry. To touch three key points. First, FARC was not a successful movement, and the nation was not in threat in 2002. That's what, what I, I understood for the first of your key points. In 1998, for the first time in history, the, we had a big military reverses or, or, or failures, like you were saying. And usually in combat, they kill 100 and, and kidnapped 98 or 100 soldiers. We didn't have the capability to go all, all over the country. We were not able to support our units with air support, with medevacuation, with troop support. And 
and they start to isolate the local governments. So in the country, the military was heavily under attack without enough capabilities, one. Second, there were more than 300 local mayors of city mayor, municipality mayors that were not able to perform their, their, their jobs in, this, in the town where they live. They have to move to the capital cities. I perform their duties by phone with people that are in the municipalities because if they go to the municipalities, they were getting killed or kidnapped by the FARC. So, and that was the, that was the reason of the lack of governance, not because of the weak government, but because of the weak security in the rural areas. At that time, as I told you the same, there was insecurity in the roads. So if, you, if we see the big picture, we see that the military and the country was in a threat because there was no governance, no security, a lack of military capability. We did a peace process in, with Perez and Pastrana. It lasted three years. They kept in 42,000 square kilometers, totally without troops, totally without any, any military support. They had their own rules in that, in, that, in that area. We could not go to our sea. And if they were ideological, maybe they will use that opportunity to make peace. But instead, they increased and doubled the number of guerrilla because of the narco traffic, because they selected the key points where drug trafficking or drug production are the biggest in Colombia, so they selected those municipalities to conduct the peace drop process. And can you imagine three years without any military or police or government uh, overview? They could uh, get co produce money for cocaine, get weapons, they double the, the people. And from that position, from that 42,000 square kilometers, they send an attack and, and kidnap and kill a lot of uh, population, civilian population, military. Uh, so that was the threat at that time. So I think at that time, the country was really in a risk, a big risk. And Plan Colombia focus, and, and I'm, I'm moving to the second, plan, second point about Colombia, Plan Colombia now being holistic. When it began, at that time, it began, and I have the official uh, numbers here, it began with 63% Military focus, as you say, you're correct, and 27% social and economic development. When I'm talking military support, I'm not talking only helicopters and weapons. When I said military support, and you can also see in the in the in the internet, it means professionalism of the military. They mean it means a human right education for the military and for the population, uh, more for the I mean for the military who are going to conduct the operations, and. 27% for the social and economic general in the country. It shifted throughout the time when security was a shift to a 20% focus in military, because we already have our own capability, and 75% in social economic, not only in the military, but also in all the rural areas. It helped us to establish a rule of law. Uh, there was a lot of investigation demanded by the US. Uh, I remember in 2002, I mean 2000, and I think it was 1999 and 2000, Colombia was decertified by the US. So Plan Colombia was not a con constant flow of money. Those two years, Colombia was seen, as you said correctly, there were like a linkage between the some military, um, and I, I, it's not all the military. I want to correct that because when you say the military are linked, you're talking about the whole military. And that's, a, I think that's a very, very strong accusation um, from, the people who are accused from that are less than less than 0.5 percent of the military, and from them, not even 10 percent have been really found guilty. It's another story, but I'm not going to focus on that. What I'm going to focus is that the U.S. saw the linkage, and they stopped the support. They said no more money for Plan Colombia, and we had two years without any support until we let's say how I say this uh, straighten our house until we. Uh, conduct investigations until we found guilty people, until we, until we change and, and, and legitimize the army as it as it's always has been, then the support became again also. So I think the support has been uh, holistic in that, in that uh, condition. Um, and the last point, uh, I think that Colombia it is an example for other countries to follow, not only because of the achievement, but because of the Colombia commitment. 
Plan Colombia, as some people don't know, maybe because they have seen in the news or I don't know, in different, different information, a different point of view. It was, a Plan Colombia was uh, made by Colombia, supported by U.S. and other international organizations. For example, the initial Plan Colombia was 5% of the Plan Colombia, that was $10 billion, was from the U.S. $131 billion from Colombia. So almost 90% was paid by Colombia. And more than money, because Plan Colombia is not money, Plan Colombia didn't have American troops on the fighting. It was advisors, it was trainers, but the people who fought Plan Colombia and keep their lives, keep their limbs, or, or lose their families, was Colombian soldiers. So that example of leadership wanted to go out of that hole of being an almost failed state, to go to a right now very uh, stable state, I think is an example, and I will say that, uh, as you said, I think that Plan Colombia is a success because we are where we are right now, and the same threat for us is paramilitaries that you have mentioned in this picture, but I'm amazed that the same picture, and maybe worse, it can be taken from the FARC side. So if we're saying that paramilitaries will go out in eight years, the FARC are asking to have no jail at all. So direct immunity, just go out of the, of the FARC and go in, re, in, in restating the society. The paramilitaries paid eight years, and there, some there are coming out, as you say, but FARC wants to pay not even one year in jail, just not pay any day of jail. So it's a balance. There are two big groups, and they filtrate, they influence political, because as well as they're political that may have links with paramilitary, there are politicals that have links with the FARC. There are NGOs that have links with FARC, there are NGOs that have links with paramilitaries. And the last thing I want to hear, I'm sorry to go too long, but I want to give you my input for you because I think you have done a wonderful job, but I want to give you also my point of view as a Colombian officer and also to all the nice people that are here today listening to this information, is Colombia is fighting a war in Colombian soil. Colombian army are made of Colombians. Colombian FARC are made of Colombians. Colombian paramilitary are made of Colombians. We all are Colombians. So, if let's say this side is far, this side is paramilitary. If somebody killed here, all this family is going to say they are the bad guys. If this side go and kill somebody in that side because any situation, this family, but we are all Colombians. So, depending on the region where you go, depending to the people that you talk, they will give you a point of view, depending on which side of the conflict are they. They are all Colombians. We're not fighting against another country. So. Victims are FARC, victims are paramilitary, victims are military, and victims are especially the population that doesn't want to be in the middle of the conflict. So that was my point of view. I'm sorry to take so long, but I, I think it's helpful for your investigation, for your, your, your work, and I appreciate your very good understanding and view of my country. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. I think we're going to hold any other questions at this point. We'll do at the book signing. And, sir, sir, that was very good. Thank you.